Number 10, Spellcast. I got a bunch of great ones coming for you right out of Babylon, so buckle in folks, you're gonna feel the wrath of King Hammurabi today. This law is to protect against those pesky conjurers, those spellcasters, those pesky wizards. Ugh, worst. This law states, <clears throat> If a man has been accused another of laying a spell upon him, but has not proved it, the accused shall go to the sacred river. He shall plunge into the sacred river, and if the sacred river shall conquer him, he that accused him shall take possession of his house. If the sacred river shall show his innocence, and he is saved, the accuser shall be put to his delifing. Oof. Basically, if you start accusing people who can't swim of spellcraft, which, I mean, everyone can't swim back then, that's just how it goes, there's no yieldy swimming lessons, or at least I don't think there was, you're gonna be the hottest real estate mogul in town. You're gonna be owning a lot of houses. All you're missing is a get out of jail free card and the orange properties, because those are always the best monopoly. Everyone loves the orange properties. I don't know why, they just do. Number nine, building code. For our Canadian fans out there, maybe you remember a certain blonde haired dad who helped rebuild not up to code buildings during the 2000s on a hit reality TV show. No, it wasn't me, silly. Mike Holmes. Yeah, Mike Holmes. We all love him. We remember him. If I've learned anything in my time as a Canadian, it's that certain beams have to be load bearing and they have to go in certain places. To learn from the show, at least. Well, another law from ancient Babylon was inspired by Mike Holmes, or uh, at least had him there in spirit. This law states, if a builder builds a house for a man and does not make its construction sound, and the house which he has built collapses and causes the de-life of the owner of the house, the builder shall be put to his own de-lifing. Listen, I would love it if there was never a single building mistake ever again, but man, that's pretty serious. I mean, come on. What would modern landlords be without some 50-year-old shoddy apartment to rent out? Give me rent. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Number 8, Operation. Remember the fun family game Operation? That's right! Folks pulling large and obtuse shaped objects out of a man who's not even asleep for his own major surgery. Water on the knee? Pfft. More like easy one, two, three, dad. I got this. Oh no, the surgery didn't go well. That'll be 30,000 Monopoly dollars. Uh oh! Continuing with the trend of messed up laws, there's one more from King Hammurabi. If a physician operates on a man for a sever wound with a bronze lancet and causes the man's perishing or destroys the man's eye, which I don't know how that would happen, but okay, they shall cut off his hand. Now, that would really spice up family board game night. Be careful with Charlie Horse Dad, wouldn't want to lose that pole polishing hand. I know I wouldn't. <laughs> uh oh! Number seven, ancient insurance. Yes, yes, I hear you. I know you wanted some laws about ancient insurance because insurance law is super interesting and of course I found something related. Not exactly insurance as you know it today. No, no waiting on hold for a claim they probably won't give you. No, this was more about justice. This law states if the robber is not captured, the man who has been robbed shall, in the presence of God, what else, make an itemized statement of his loss and the city and the governor in whose jurisdiction the robbery was committed shall compensate him for whatever was lost. Kind of like a forced insurance policy. Judging from the last couple of points, I don't want to see what happens if they find out you falsify that information before before God. I don't, I don't think that would be a good idea for you. Don't do it. Number six, farmers. Irrigation. It's the invention that made agriculture boom. Now in Mesopotamia, people could grow food, lots of food, and civilization kind of just built itself around it. However, this irrigation was all fueled by mother nature, so floods and droughts kind of put a damper on that. It's kind of like when I fart. I never know when it's gonna happen, it just does. Kind of like the force. Maybe sometimes I force it out. Anyway, this law states that if a man neglects to maintain his dike and does not strengthen it and a break is made in his dike, then the water is carried away from the farmland. The man in whose dike the break has been made shall replace the grain which has been damaged. If he is not able to replace the grain, they shall sell him and his goods, and the farmers whose grain the water has carried away shall divide the proceeds from the sale. Now listen, I, I like that because I grew up in, in rural Canada, so you know farmers helping each other. I like that, neighborly, except the part uh, where the guy that makes a mistake, we sell him and take his stuff. That part I don't like. Helping each other's great. Dividing the proceeds is awesome, but maybe we should be nice to Bill. Sometimes Bill makes mistakes. That's all I'm saying. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. 
So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together, and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything, and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars, and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is, after a while, it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly, if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly, it's the it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month, we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. Hi hieroglyphs are hard, man. I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No. But they did have to tell time. And as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out, though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors, actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Number 10, only the rich can wear purple. Oh yes, the wealthy and elite of Rome. What a sight it must have been. Gorgeous marble, the amazing architecture, and the vino. Oh. Baby, sign me up. Someone take me back. We have to thank the Romans for a lot. They were pretty important for culture, history, and well, just about everything. They're the Romans. However, this doesn't make them impervious to stupidity. No matter how great your society is, eh, there's going to be some dumb stuff. Take, for example, the law that poor Romans were forbidden from wearing luxurious purple. Yes, that's right. Romans were gatekeeping purple. Listen, I love purple just as much as Samuel Jackson does, but you don't see me gatekeeping it. That's like me gatekeeping chicken parm. Something so delicious should be shared with the world. I would argue that any society that doesn't allow their citizens to purchase certain goods because of their wealth, well, they're missing the point, especially from a capitalist point of view. I love shopping, I love them all. I wanna buy purple and I want the chicken parm, baby. Number nine, Draco's Law. 
Draco, the ancient Greek legislator, was sitting alone one day and said to himself, Man, you know, I'm, I'm tired of petty criminals getting away with their petty crimes and their pettiness. So he, in a nutshell, basically said that anyone who commits a crime ever will have to pay with their lives. Ooh. But see, this begs the question, what about the lovely people in our society who commit the most heinous crimes? Should they be treated as the same who steal a loaf of bread from the baker? Mm, I don't know about that. Or what about even lesser crimes? Now, without incriminating yourself, I'm a friend of Saul Goodman, by the way, so please don't do that. He wouldn't want you to. But think of all the little crimes that you've done and never saw the inside of a jail cell. Not even theft, I'm talking even more smaller than that. Like jaywalking, for example. We've all done jaywalking. Everyone's done it. Traffic violations, all that kind of law. Look, the law isn't perfect, but we can't put everyone away on the chopping block just because they stole your eraser in the sixth grade. That's not how it works. Number eight, King Hammurabi. Oh, wise King Hammurabi, what knowledge of Babylon do you bring us today? The law, how's that? Yeah, 282 to be exact. However, what's more interesting is the eye for an eye motto that these laws were written around. If a thief did get sticky fingers in the cookie jar, then perhaps he should lose the hand that was caught inside said cookie jar. Should a woman be caught with a lover, then her and the lover shall be tossed into the Tigris. A man can have multiple lovers, though that's, that's fine, of course. Well, it has to be fair. Come on, it wouldn't be fair if a man couldn't do that. Come on. If someone accuses someone of something but can't produce acceptable evidence, then the person who was accusing would end up, well, not alive. I think you guys get the point. I have nothing to worry about because I'm a good boy and I've never done anything wrong ever. Nope. I've never been in the timeout corner. <laughs> Number seven. Hands off my cocoa puffs. Wheat, grain. Today, a lot of our grains get consumed in a bowl of 2% milk for a healthy and balanced breakfast. I'm a man who enjoys a little Quaker life. It's good stuff. However, back in ancient times, grain was important. Grain makes bread, and that's about as plentiful and cheap as you can get. So the Romans took it very seriously. If you dare cut or take someone else's grain, you could wind up in some real trouble, Buster. But only if you were a man. The uh, D-Life penalty wasn't applied to anyone that was young or not a man. Instead, they had to pay back double what they took in grain. Today, if someone took my grain, I probably wouldn't have an issue with it. I live in a city. I got no room for grain. It's too cumbersome. Plus, who has time to make bread in this lifestyle? I'm too busy trying to make you guys laugh. Although, if you guys want to cook and bake me stuff, uh, I'm not going to say no. Number six, false song. Another one from the Romans. This one is quite silly. Okay, so remember Weird Al Yankovic? Yeah, classic 80s parody songwriter and performer. He was living it up in the 80s, right? With songs like Eat It and Like a Sergeant. If you know, you know, it's good stuff. Well, there was a law in ancient Rome that forbid this kind of chicanery, nonsensical tomfoolery, if you will. I, for one, enjoy some of the Weird Al stuff. It's funny, creative, and honest to God, some are just better than the original. That's how it goes. Well, you couldn't do this in ancient Rome unless it was true. So basically, you can't sing about food unless it's really a song about food and not me changing the lyrics to an existing song that was already about food. Otherwise, you'd end up somewhere you don't want to be. Number five, Iron Pillar. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is, well, it's pretty self-explanatory actually. It's, it's an Iron Pillar, which is more than 1,600 years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi. As if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron. Plus its size. I don't know, my pea-sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number four, Chinese seismoscope. At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. 
That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show, good show. Number three. Antikythera Mechanism. I kind of hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera Mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the 2nd century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar. Which is just crazy. We know that people did study that, and gear based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two, Roman dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron. And guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from 4 to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number 1. Easter Island. If you thought this point was going to be about the huge statues on the island, well, think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually going to be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? Alright bees, what did you think? My brain kind of hurts from just thinking about some of these and I think I'm gonna go have a little lie down. Number 10, Mesa Verde. When I think of places I'd like to pop my city, I can honestly say I don't first think of under a cliff. But think about it, natural protection from the elements, assuming the cliff doesn't erode away over time like everything does, dropping huge chunks of rock on you from above. At Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, you'll find the remains of cliff dwellings and the cliff palace of the Pueblo people who inhabited the area around 900 years ago. The Pueblo people lived for a long time on top of the top of the mesas for over 600 years and then began to move to and build anything from storage rooms to whole villages underneath the cliffs, probably for protection from the climate change and harsh weather, but I'm assuming it was to just get some well needed shade. Number 9, Samarkand. All roads lead to Rome. Well, then all silk roads lead to Samarkand. Or at least it was a famous pit stop along the way. No one is quite sure when Samarkand was founded. Some evidence suggests that there had been humans living in the area from at least 40,000 years ago. Long time. But one thing is for sure, both its history and finances were quite wealthy. Silk jade and all the goods that the Silk Road offered made their way to and through Samarkand. This made the city very wealthy. It exchanged empires the same way I exchanged bad gifts from your aunt at Christmas. Persian, Greek, Mongol, and most recently Soviet in what is now called Uzbekistan. Today you can still find ancient buildings and mosques from a time long past, as that was the main religion. However, the city was also a place of culture and art, which meant for a long time there was some coexistence going on. But it's really nice amongst the different faiths. Very nice, I like. Number 8, Orkney Islands. You've heard of Stonehenge, but that's been overdone countless times before. You want something new, a different location with the added benefit of having other sites for the kids to go to and check out nearby. 
Look no further than the stunning Orkney Islands, home to the stones of Stennis, Meishau, the Ring of Bodgar, and Scarabray otherwise known as the heart of Neolithic Orkney. Stenez is our main standing stone henge like attraction. Meishau is a lovely underground burial mound sporting some striking 12th century Viking graffiti. Scarabray is an in ground stone built Neolithic settlement. And last but not least, the Ring of Brodgar is an even bigger circle of stones. You'll be well removed here at Orkney, situated as an archipelago right at the tippy top of Scotland with stunning views, angry Scottish neighbours and the Nordic founded town of Kirkwall. Just bring a jacket maybe. Number 7 Nan Madal. This is one I had never heard of before. Very interesting too, especially one that has been described as the Venice of the Pacific. Sometimes I'm described as that. Not really. Some even think it has connections to Atlantis. Ooh, maybe. That I'm not sure of. However, if you took a pleasure cruise with your spouse down to the Pacific, and why not? Most people can't say that they've done that, so go do it. You would find an ancient stone ruins built upon some land, and more interestingly, built upon a coral reef. A series of small artificial islands connected by canals. Ones belonging to the Saudler dynasty, I'm pretty sure I said that right, which yes, that's new to me too. Today, Namadal is a protected heritage site. So you know what, Bumblebees? Don't go there and take anything that you weren't supposed to. Go look, but don't touch. I'm watching. I'm watching. Always watching. Number six, the city of Karl Supe. The ancient city of Karl Supe is the oldest civilization center in the whole of the Americas, being over 5,000 years old. You'll find this lovely world heritage site in the desert of Peru's Supe Valley, north of the Lima River. Being first built in 26,000 BC before the Great Pyramids were even built, the site itself has temples, an amphitheater, plazas, and ordinary houses. The society that actually built and lived here were apparently a gentle society, built on commerce and pleasure. Which is backed up by the fact that we haven't really found any defenses, mangled bodies, or tools of war. We did find tools of music though, specifically 32 flutes and 37 cornets. So the Andean people who inhabited this place didn't fight and they knew how to have a hoedown. Let's bring back this way of life, yeah, maybe? Number 5. Ancient Egyptian if you can build the pyramids, then you can write a language. I said that. I coined that phrase. Put, put a stamp on it. Put some, put some envelopes on it. Put, put a stamp on it. Truth be told, it's the other way around. Some serious math went into making those bad boys. We'll never know 100% how they were built, but the balding man on the History Channel said it was alien, so that's what it had to have been. The ancient Egyptian language has been extinct for over a thousand years. The combination of hieroglyphs and no vowels makes it a very difficult language to understand, or just what it sounded like. Now, I am a doctor, a lawyer, a fireman, detective, and an archaeologist, and I would love to tell you what I think it sounded like, but I just can't do that. And even I'm stumped, man. I'm all those guys, and I'm stumped. I don't, I don't know. Wow. Number four, Berber. I honestly never heard of this one, but thanks to my dyslexia when I was researching, I thought it said Bieber. I know, right? <laughs> and I thought I was about to get flashbacks to when I was for sure not jealous of Justin Bieber because every girl on planet Earth thought he was cute and not me. Ugh! Therapy? Pfft, no, I'm fine. I don't need, I'm, not, I'm not upset at all, dude. Leave me alone, dude. I'm fine. I'm, I'm not jealous. What do you mean? Apparently, this was the language spoken in Morocco by the Berber people, not Bieber, Berber. Fun fact, there are more people of Berber descent and culture than people who still speak the language, which is kind of weird to think about, actually. While there are still some who speak it in Northern Africa, it is not as common as English or Mandarin for that matter, so thus, it is a language we have lost. Number three, Osage. Oh, to be Gloria Graham on the Oklahoma Range. It's a good musical, watch it. Well, maybe not considering what happened to the Osagi tribe. The Osagi were an Indian tribe that lived in Oklahoma and the Kansas area. What happened to them? Well, just like pretty much every other Indian tribe in North America, they got shafted. In the colonial days, it was waves and waves of Europeans showing up and slowly pushing them out of their homelands. When governments were being formed and they needed more land, they asked them nicely. At gunpoint, through years of people being moved and culture diluted, the language slowly dissolved over time. Today, there's only about 15 to 20 speakers of the Osagi language, which over time is a far cry from what it originally sounded like. So hence again, it is a lost language. 
Number 2. A Pico Enter the Mato Grosso, South America, thick, dense jungle. Hiding in that thick rainforest vegetation are creatures who go bump in the night. Panthers and jaguars, venomous snakes and bugs, piranhas. And a weird fish that likes to swim up urethras. I, there's a peepee -pee fish. I don't, why? Why? Who, why would they do that? Who made that? Why would the river do that? However, something cool to find in the jungle is the last speaker of a pika. Apparently, there's just a bro chilling in the rainforest. Like, yeah, man, I'm that guy, pal. I'm that dude. Come on and learn some Apica, dude. I'm your guy. Brazil, being a Portuguese colony, eventually replaced all native languages, including Apica, just like they did in North America. Same sort of situation. Well, as long as the dude gets to chill in the rainforest and nobody's actually trying to cut the Amazon rainforest, I'm sure everything is fine, right? <laughs> the approaching sounds of chainsaw. You know what I mean? <laughs> Number one, Acadian. The cradle of all civilization. The civilizations of Mesopotamia between two rivers. When people figured out that if we throw seeds in the ground and add some water and wait for the sun to soak that up, that makes lots of food. And if you own that land, that means you own the food and that's what everyone needs to live and that means you become king. And when there's lots of food, you need workers to harvest the food, which means you need money to pay the workers. And now there's towns and language to share and buy in the market. And that's exactly what happened in Mesopotamia. It was a really messy description, but we're gonna go with it. Where the first empire was formed, the Akkadian Empire. With that is the Akkadian language, which was a fusional language originating from Assyrian. If we had a time machine, it would be cool to see this stuff happening. The dawn of modern civilization. Many parents at home will understand this euphemism. But since this was the first empire, just like your first kid, it's bound to make a few mistakes, here and there. It's okay, we got it right in like the third try. Shout out to all the firstborns who are the test child. How you doing? Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow covered state. <laughs> nice. Now with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins, simple, that's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange, I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before. And if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. 
The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron based compounds as well as blue, green, white and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number 6 The Haircut a little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. Eh, it kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men, we just look better with them, we look, we look good, it's a good look. Number 5 Bug Repellent I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I smell certain things, it reminds me of stuff. I'm like that rat in Ratatouille, just, oh, I love fr France, it smells like France in there. I don't know. <laughs> don't smell your own farts, chief, I don't know. As summer is just about to begin for me, it's sunscreen, beer, and of course, bug repellent. I don't know exactly what's in the bug repellent, but I know it doesn't work very well, and I know it smells like it's shaving minutes off my life. Ooh, not good. Well, ancient Egyptians had their own version of bug repellent. When the pharaohs and royals wished to enjoy a picnic outside in the beautiful sun, oftentimes there would be bugs. So to prevent this, they found the next closest servant and slathered them in honey. Lots of honey. Ooh, too much. And then placed them a safe distance away from said picnic. Do this a few times and you've got yourself a bona fide fly trap. Now you can enjoy your picnic in peace. You know, just ignore the servant screaming and because they're being eaten alive by flies and all kinds of bugs. Ooh, kind of gross. Number four, mouse toothpaste. A lot of things I can understand. There, there's a point to it all. It adds up. Checks out. The mouse toothpaste does not check out or add up. I talked to the chief and he said that's not it. Yes, the ancient Egyptians knew that dental hygiene was very important, as it is. Go brush your teeth. They knew brushing their teeth was important, as well, yeah, as it is. And it should be noted that they may have invented the toothbrush. Hmm, pretty cool. However, it is in my humble opinion that they missed the mark on the toothpaste. There's no Colgate around. Basically, you take a cute little mouse and you crush it up until it's just a paste or essence of a mouse, as they call it. Then, to combat what I'm sure was a horrific scent, herbs and spices were added, oftentimes mint, for that minty fresh breath that everyone so needs. Disgusting. No thank you. I'll pass. Number three, mummies. Yes, we all know the ancient Egyptians had mummies. Pharaohs and kings wrapped up like a good Christmas gift in preparation for the afterlife. You may have heard some things about it, and I'm here to tell you all the awful stomach churning things you've heard. They're true. That's right. In particular, the removal of the brain. While the ancient Egyptians were incredibly smart and talented, the process for removing the brain had the same finesse your grandpa had trying to get ketchup out of a glass bottle. I'll get it eventually. Yep, it's coming. <laughs> I'll get it. A long iron stick was used to be inserted into the nose until it reached your brain, right past the fifth grade memories. The next step was to stir vigorously until you could lay the person on their stomach and the brain came out in what was probably the most offensive pink slurry I've ever had the displeasure to think of. Disgusting. Disgusting? I can't believe you done that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Number two, makeup. Surprise, surprise. The ancient Egyptians came up with another invention, makeup. The billion dollar industry that isn't going anywhere. You might be surprised to know that both men and women wore makeup back then. Although today that's that's a case too. And a, a, as an actor, I've worn makeup a lot. It's really not that big of a deal, really. What is a big deal, however, is how they made it. If you've ever seen any images of Egyptians, then you know how blue and green eyeliner is a must have. Well, the main ingredient in that eyeliner isn't paint, folks. It's beetles and bugs. Gross. Colorful bugs were crushed up and added to make compounds in order to achieve the Egyptian look. Number one, Shepherd of the Anus. Like I said before, the Egyptians contributed greatly to art, medicine, engineering. They were smart. 
But for the last point today, we're going to focus on medicine and more specifically the doctors who were most likely the first proctologists. Way to go, Egypt. The Egyptian for these behind doctors literally traits to shepherd of the anus. They would administer medicine and, of course, the always famous and pleasurable enemas. They loved enemas in ancient Egypt. Who would have thought? They thought, they thought it was a gift, gift from the gods. Crazy. Number 10, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number nine, Damascus steel. While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys, please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs, but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. The best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which <laughs> can I just say sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscript kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that though. The Voynich Manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants, but then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort Swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? That is an excellent question, and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel, the recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there were a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like, like even grape juice or something and put it in the pot, 
The pots now become batteries, generating about 2 volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for. Probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, basket of bees. Guess what this one is? It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the Dark Ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows, I don't know. History gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, eh, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? Number four, the Colosseum. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know. That's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge. It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archaeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a tenth lays discovered with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic, 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kind of. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and... Also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tums to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before tums. See, what you would do is you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go <clears throat> and then put it back and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster, because hey, now you made room. Number two. Gladiators. If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then yeah, absolutely nailed it, because that's pretty well it. A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the Gladiator games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, okay, you're Spartacus. Spart okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. 
Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the Gladiator, though living just to their mid-20s. I mean, it was its pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy, which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from 8 to 10 fights in their whole career. Come on, dude. 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle! Oh, no, 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 no! And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of, like, Spartacus, just... Yeah, that's nice, I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time, until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once the thriving city of Pompeii. We found a snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time. It was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada that looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? Number 10, Latin. The language of ancient Rome and classrooms across the world. While some nerds would like to argue that it's still used today, and I'm sure a lot of you still know how to speak it, it is still used, but its widespread use outside of the medical profession or talking about ancient Rome is nil. Nobody ever says, well, I'm going on business in Europe. Better bring my Latin guide. That's a crazy statement because one, this is an age of information and smartphones and the internet. So that kind of just beats maps and guidebooks every time. You can just Google everything. And two, because nobody is speaking Latin. I did always find it weird that when reading a textbook in school, everything got a Latin name. You got your Felis Catus, you got your Canis Lupus, and many other things that I cannot pronounce. And I know there's gonna be some nerds out there like, yeah, I can read Latin, dude, stop. I know how to do it. Number nine, Sanskrit. Latin was the granddaddy of languages in Europe. Well, Sanskrit may have been the first written language ever, which is actually mind-bending to think about. Imagine coming up with words and sounds and characters, and then everyone around you was like, yeah, okay, yeah, let's go with this. I like this, this is cool. It's speculated that its passing was around 600 BC. However, you may still hear about this one outside the classroom as India has it down as an official language, considering that all the old scrolls and scripts of Buddhism and Hindu are written in Sanskrit. That just makes sense. And like Latin and its many philosophers, Sanskrit's own Vedas are up for study as well. Will I study it? No, no I won't. I'd rather spend my time trying to make you guys laugh. Cause I can't read. Number 8, Old Norse. This one is a personal favorite of mine, and who doesn't love a good Viking story? I mean, come on, they're super cool. Well, assuming you're on their side, I, I wouldn't want to fight them. Sadly for our not horned helmet coastal raiders, the language that berserkers would shout when bifurcating an enemy in half has been lost to time. How can this happen, you may ask? Well, it's quite simple, actually. After settling so many lands and spreading out, peacefully. Eventually, everyone was split up and time moved on. Each area of the Nordic peoples developed their own language, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. It's kind of like when you graduate from high school and you and your friends tell each other that you'll be best friends forever, except after the first summer off and everyone goes away to college. You get busy and it's, it's hard to make plans. Then the next summer, when you're trying to reconnect, your friends look different and they sound different and it's not the same. And it's really scary. Number seven, Old English. This is something I always bring up during conversations of time travel and it's why I have a theory that if we ever discover time travel or make it, it will be marketed as a high priced tourist trap because you'll never be able to stay, especially if it's anything from the last hundred years. That doesn't make any sense. Crazy tinfoil theories aside though, something I know for a fact is that if you went back in time and tried to say hello to your English ancestors, there would be a little bit of a snafu. You would not understand them. After the Norman victory, Anglo-Saxon was on the way out. All this talk of different ancient civs, I, I gotta say, it really makes me wanna hop on the Age of Empires. You know what I'm saying? I miss that game. Also, let us know in the comments where you would go if you were time traveling. I'm curious. I'll read those comments in an upcoming video. I, I wanna know, where would you guys go? Number six, Ancient Greek. 
Oh, to live in a coastal town in Greece, crystal blue waters, beautiful hot sun, and all the yogurt I could eat. Oh. Nothing beats drinking wine, spread starfish in my birthday suit on my white marble terrace. Well, my dreams of living in Greece aren't the only things that have gone out the window. Ancient Greeks simply evolved over time. Will I ever understand any of it? I doubt it. I struggle with English as is, as you probably know. But I like Mediterranean food, so that's gotta count for something, right? Maybe if I study enough of the great philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, and my Greek neighbor, dude's old enough and wise enough to know everything, maybe I'll get somewhere, who knows? Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's let's go. Let's go. Let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what? I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards, wiping your bottom. That's what I'm talking about. Now. They did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seemed to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee 
to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, firsthand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. A as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh? Maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. 
for Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts. And if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor, no way. My body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chainmail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start with a little, little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official tink tink. Knight, that's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal Skywalker. Happy Number five, whales. Back in the day, a whale, dolphin, or any animal like that could fetch you a high price. So every once in a while, a creature like that washes up on the beach. You can understand why everyone would want such a stinky, rotting corpse. Whale oil was a hot commodity of the past. Edward II, being the snobby royal that he was, said, Nah, why you made it, bruv? The whales, that's more oil. You know, get not that's more. So in 1324, he made a law that said any whale that washes up on shore belongs to him. Now, I'm not exactly sure how that works because there's no phones and it would take a minute to get the message to them, but if the whales wash up on the beach, it ain't going anywhere, so uh, have fun fighting over it. Good luck, good luck, guys. Number four, stolen milk. Texas, the land of cowboys, barbecue, and Jesus. America at its finest. Shout out to Texas. How you folks doing? I'd love to come out and see you sometime. Maybe when I'm famous. Anyway, there's a law from Texas from way back in the day that I think was very strange. Up until 1974, it was illegal to milk your neighbor's cow. Now, for those that don't live in the country, I'd be the first to tell you how important agricultural communities are, and dairy farmers are some of the finest. Although I find it strange because after a long day of milking your cows, no farmer ever said, well, <laughs> better over, uh, better go over to Dale's house and milk his cows. He ain't gonna do it. <laughs> no one ever said that. Farming's hard. The law was most likely there to protect those that would steal the white gold, not so much as awkwardly come over and milk old Betsy for you. It's kind of a weird thought. Number three, marriage in the afterlife. Oh boy, this one is so weird. Since the 19th century in France, marrying a corpse has been legal. Now, I know what we're all thinking, and that ain't the reason why it happened. Don't get, get your mind out of the gutter. Stop, stop it. It was more about legal birthright, like if your husband perished in battle before little Louis was born. However, I just can't stomach the issue of your partner being a corpse. Baby, I love you, and I don't care if your eyes are hanging out by a skull with a tendon. It doesn't matter to me that a stray dog took your leg away. Your intestines hanging out of your stomach is beautiful to me. That's just a new fashion trend. Oh, and the smell? Oh, I love the graveyard smell, honey. You're beautiful. Just weird. Imagine like showing up to a party like, hi, this is my wife, this is Christine. Number two, no Christmas. I don't know about you guys, but I love Christmas. Don't get me wrong, I'm looking forward to seeing all my friends at the cottage this summer. I got the Hawaiian shirt on, we're, we're cruising baby, I love it. But Christmas, man, that's my favorite. It's the shopping stress. I love to see the joy in people's faces when you get them gifts. I love gifts, dinner, the desserts, I love it all. And of course, I was always a good boy on Christmas, I promise, mm -hmm. never bad once. Well, back in the 1600s, King Charles I was unhappy with another group that did not share his religious values. It's kind of a trend in history. So for this, he canceled Christmas. He outlawed Christmas. 
How awful! Imagine, no more awkward dinners with your uncle saying something insensitive at the dinner table. No more stuffing your face with good food, and no more Santa Claus. I didn't think he was a thing back then in the 1600s, but uh, we'll go with it. So back in 1660, this law was revoked under new management, and thank goodness, because I love Christmas. Thank you for that. Thank you. Number one, trial by combat. My brother in Christ, this one is really strange. I Sometimes marriages don't work out, things happen, life is not easy, and managing your way through a relationship can be tough. So, anyone that's going through a divorce right now, the best advice I could give you is that, look, you once loved each other at some point, so do your best, have some grace, and split peacefully. It's just better for everyone that way, including yourselves. That being said, a medieval German tradition was to decide on divorces by combat. What else, of course? The husband would sit in a hole with his arm tied and uh, have a bag of rocks, and the wife would have a club. Basically, it was time to go Katniss Everdeen on each other. And I can't really describe what happens next, because you two probably wouldn't like it. But that's how it goes. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Carol. An American history professor named Paul Kosuk was absolutely fascinated by ancient settlements, like I'm sure a lot of us are. But this passion led to him devoting much of his time to studying in Peru, which has such an incredibly rich history. In 1948, while in Peru, Paul made the discovery he had been waiting for when he came across the dry remains of an ancient city. The remains were carbon dated and placed to be about 5,000 years old. The city of Carroll was once the home to around 3,000 inhabitants pre-Inca, and this was already a thriving location while the pyramids were being built. That is how old the settlement is. It appeared to be quite a peaceful place as there were no obvious signs of battles or weapons, but among the remains were homes, plazas, temples, and even an amphitheater. It is said that the city was abandoned in 2000 BC, and in 2009 AD, it was made a World Heritage Site. In our number 9 spot today, we have Irem of the Pillars. This place is also known as Atlantis of the Sands, and it is a lost city or area that is spoken of in the Quran. In the Quran, it is said to be a place that is full of lofty buildings, and it was populated by a group known as Ad. This group had turned away from Allah, so the prophet Hud was sent to summon them back. The people did not listen or obey, and as a result, it is said that they were punished with a sandstorm being sent to the area for seven days and seven nights. In the end, and the city is said to have vanished beneath the sands as if it never even existed. In the 1990s, a team, which was led by Nicholas Clapp, who is an amateur archaeologist and filmmaker, announced that they had found this lost city. It is said that this was done using NASA's remote sensing satellites, ground penetrating radar, and images taken by the Space Shuttle Challenger. These tools gave them the opportunity to see old camel trade routes and where they all once converged. This point is a well known area, and once excavated, it is said to have revealed the area known as Irem of the Pillars. In our number 8 spot today, we have Heracleon, also known as Thonis to the Egyptians. This was an ancient city that was located near the mouth of the Nile River. Greek legend says that this was the city where Hercules took his first steps into Africa, as well as the place where Paris hid Helen before the Trojan War began. This is all to say that, to legend, the city was super important. But aside from legend, no one knew where this place was or how to find it. Well, just over 2,000 years ago, it turns out that either an earthquake, a tsunami, or a combination of the two hit the city and submerged it underwater. It used to be believed that Thonis and Heracleon were two separate places and that they were both located on what is now Egyptian mainland, but neither of those things turned out to be true. In reality, in 1999, after five years of searching, archaeologist Frank Gaudio located the ruins of the city underwater as they had been submerged in the ocean. Since then, excavations and explorations of the ancient city have taken place and it was stocked full of some incredibly cool treasures from thousands of years ago. In 2010, a type of ancient Nile riverboat was found here, and even not too long ago, in August of 2021, it was announced that wicker baskets that contained fruits of the doom palm tree, as well as grape seeds that date back to the earliest 4th century BC, had been found among the ruins. In our number 7 spot today, we have Arctic hyenas, changing it up a bit to ancient remains. Only a few years ago, scientists discovered teeth ancient teeth from Arctic hyenas. When you think of hyenas, you wouldn't ever imagine that they once roamed over Europe and Asia, but 5 million years ago, that was normal everyday life for these bad boys. Remains of these Arctic beasts have been found mainly in the Yukon permafrost. Evolutionary biologist Jack Zhang studies prehistoric carnivores, and he knew within minutes that these recent Yukon molars belonged to Arctic hyenas, aka Chasmaporthets. We'll go with that. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Crusader Sword. 
board. Get your goggles on for this next one, folks. We are going deep. I found a few shells in my life, but never a sword that once belonged to a crusader knight. That's just next level. An Israeli scuba diver, not even that far experienced, ended up stumbling across one of the coolest discoveries in 2021. Shlomi Katzen was diving off the Carmel coast in Israel when this peculiar shape caught their eye. As if a crusader sword wasn't enough, the diver also found anchors, ancient stones, pottery fragments, all from around 900 years ago. I wouldn't even notice this. It's covered in barnacles. I wouldn't even dare go near it to begin with. Kudos. Great catch. Number five, short king. Short kings rejoice for I have found invulnerability, or at least diplomatic immunity. There was a law in Qin Dynasty China that said any man or woman shorter than five foot two could not be guilty of any crimes. However, I'd like to ask a few questions. So Brianna, that's our lovely editor, she's fantastic. Get ready for a speed round of questions. What if you were a kid who was over the height limit and committed these crimes? What if you had lost one of your limbs, thus making your height shorter, even though your original height was more than the required height? What if it was a crime from a really long time ago and you shrunk with old age and now you're below the limit, even though when the crime was done years ago, you were over the limit? What if train A leaves Chicago for Detroit going 60 miles per hour, and at the same time, on an adjacent track, a train leaves Detroit, heading for Chicago in 45 miles per hour. Detroit is 280 miles away. So where are they gonna meet up? What's gonna happen? I don't know, too many questions. My brain can't handle that. Oh man, too many questions. Number four, ladies in yellow. Venice, 1400s. If the Assassin's Creed series taught me anything, is that it was a great time, and that running on rooftops in a unique white robe was just a part of life. I really miss those games, man. The new ones just, well, they kind of suck. I mean, we had it all back then. There was Venice recreated in all its glory shops, stalls, mercenaries, thieves, and of course, my favorite, ladies of the evening. In the game, these ladies can be hired to make useful distractions against the lonely Borgia guards. You can identify these ladies as there's a giant glowing emblem above them that says they are for hire. Well, they didn't have that back in the 1400s, obviously. So the business was doing so well, uh, the red light district if you want to call it, that the Venetian government wanted the ladies to wear yellow. You know, in case you have to uh, do any sleuthing about, if you uh, know what I'm saying. <laughs> Number three, no armor in parliament. I guess this makes sense. Back in 1313, it was decided that no man shall wear armor in Parliament. Hard to say that without a British accent, it's fun. Strangely enough, this wasn't changed even though knight's armor kind of became obsolete. So in theory, if you walked into Parliament in knight regalia, maybe minus a sword and or a mace, because uh, you probably wouldn't get very far with that, but you'd be breaking a law regardless just wearing the knight stuff. Supposedly this law has its origins from Edward II being picked on by other barons and nobles. I just think it's a matter of comfort, really. Moving is one thing, but imagine sitting in a room with a hundred other men and women wearing armor, no windows, and trying to hear a conversation. There'd be a lot of metal clanking, and uh, on a hot summer day, I'd be a little stinky. Number two, Napoleon Swine. This one is just too weird not to mention, but Napoleon, the Corsican ogre, mostly remembered for his military tactics, and to be fair, the, the dude was good. He, he, he was pretty good. However, not talked about very much, or at least as much as his military successes, was his crazy political stint as the Emperor of France. Yeah, weird. France was going through some changes, and during all this craziness, Napoleon managed to make himself Emperor. And just like the revolution before him tried to give the people power, well, it kind of went to his head. Well, there's a lot of heads and deheading back then. <laughs> it kind of went to his head, making laws and decrees that were kind of, well, messed up. One such law was to protect his public image. No one was to jest him. Thus, a law was created that no pig shall be named after Napoleon. Okay, fair, but in my opinion, naming anything after the guy who stripped you of your rights and plunged the world into what could be considered one of the first world wars ever, well, that's the last thing I'd want to name anything. Yeah, I wouldn't want that. I see you're drinking 1%. Is that because you think you're fat? Number one, punishment of the sack. I just had to put this one in here. Sort of a law, but more of a punishment that fits the law, but it's all intertwined, it, it makes sense, and it's just cool for number one. Basically, back in Roman times, life was good. They had so much time to think. Think about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Oh, beautiful, gorgeous. Well, they also had time to think about this really creative punishment. Ponina aculi, or aculi, ponina aculi. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. My Latin's not that great. Or penalty of the sack. Basically, you get a big sack. You blindfold your perpetrator. You then throw in a dog, a monkey, a snake, a chicken. 
This sack of fun then gets thrown into a deep body of water. Thus, the show begins. Now, I can't even imagine the foulness of what would happen inside that sack. So, to avoid this, I will behave myself. No need to put me in the timeout corner. Plus, Saul Goodman's my lawyer. He's my friend. He can get me into anything. Well, except maybe a sack full of uh, crazy screaming animals. That would that would be a horrible way to, to not live anymore. That would be pretty bad. Kick you off the list at number 10. Field of the Cloth of Gold. 1520, King Henry VIII of England and King Francis I of France. They're talking, they're planning, and they figure what better way to nurture this relationship we have here, this working relationship with one another. Let's have a party, let's celebrate, why not? Two nations drinking together. What could go wrong, right? Well, this party lasted for two and a half weeks. Nobody really knew when or how to end it, but royals on both sides did know how to impress one another. And they did so by drinking more and more. And then they jousted in that order. Yeah, it was a horrible chain of events. They ate meat from over 4,000 lambs, 1,000 ox, you name it. They were pouring resources into this big party. All of their resources, in fact. And eventually the two lads just wrestled it out. Something they really just should have started with all along instead of involving others or their food supply. Yeah, both nations were completely drained of resources, food, treasury, you name it. Come 1521, they were at war all over again. Just one year later, but an absolute waste of time. But hey, they got to see two grown men wrestle, so... That's fun, I guess, in these times. Number 9, Festival of Drunkenness. Once upon a time in ancient Egypt, the big guy, Ra, god of the sun, heaven, kingship, power, and light, got upset with humanity and sent Hathor to teach us a lesson. She turned into a lion and began going around hunting humans, chasing us into the desert where she would drink our blood. Lovely. This made Ra feel a little bad, so he ordered his followers to bring him hematite and beer that he mixed together to make a blood-like liquid, over 7,000 jars of the stuff. And he flooded the fields with it, which Hathor drank and drank and drank until she became so drunk she passed out. Because of Ra's decision to save us from the deity he sicked on us, the ancient Egyptians celebrated the festival of drunkenness. Basically, the people were allowed to drink, dance, do the deed, and light torches every 20th day of Toth at home or in temples with everyone else until they got so drunk that they passed out, just like Hathor. As far as excuses to drink and have massive parties go, this one's pretty solid, yeah. Number eight, the Red Wedding. January 28th, 1393, you are formally invited to a masquerade ball. Finally, it's about time. The French Queen Isabeau of Bavaria is hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade. Bring your finest cracows, my friend. When the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the Queen's ladies in waiting, it was a big deal, it was a happy day. For some, it was the best day of their lives. For others, at this ball, not so great. Not such a great day. King Charles VI had five companions all perform a dance. A dance routine, how fun. Weddings have those, those are a good time. They did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bit. They had masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were literal beasts. The party was going well, wine was spilling, beasts were roaring, it was a good time. But one rule was put into place before this party went underway. Absolutely, positively, no candles. Mm -mm. Obviously, right? I mean, look at these dudes. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event and forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. What an idiot. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of these beasts. Either way, this was a tragic event that took the lives of four people. Hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. Number seven, Nero's Golden House. I couldn't imagine a worse time than not being able to leave a party when you want. I am famous for pulling an Irish goodbye and leaving without saying a word to anybody when my social battery reaches 0%. But that wouldn't fly at Nero's crazy parties. His Domus Ore, or Golden House, was where he held the craziest, heinous parties you ever did see. Massive feasts that they couldn't leave unless they ate enough to vomit or if and this is where it gets heinous, they did the dirty. Yes, the shika shika boom boom. According to legend, Nero would dress himself in animal skin and have men and women alike tied to posts where he would, well, you get the picture. People who went to these massive crazy parties were not allowed to leave until he said the party was over. See, Nero wasn't really known for being the most sane of Roman emperors, okay? Number six, Bacchanalia. 
If you've ever dreamt of joining an ancient Roman wine cult, well, the second century BC would have been a perfect time for you to be born. Sorry, you're just a tad late. I mean, now you get YouTube, but you're missing all this sticky goodness. We'll get them next time, Adam. Romans would gather in these cultic celebrations, all in the name of Bacchus, the wine god. These gatherings would be held in private, hopefully, or quiet areas of the woods. Again, hopefully. They would dance, they would cook food, they would eat, they would drink a lot, and then things would get rather intimate. They would dance a little closer with one another. Yeah, that was the whole point of this cult. You'd gather in small homes to dance the night away, if I can say that. Some accounts say people would often get poisoned in these ancient wine parties. It was pretty dangerous. It was like a dark theme, I guess. Ancient Romans just did that, I guess. So by the time 186 BC rolled around, the Roman Senate voted to end these cult gatherings. Rightfully so. Yeah, the smell alone, great call. Nobody did it like the Romans. Yuck. Number five. Hattusa, rejoice my late 90s PC gamers for I bring another point in your honor, the city of Hattusa of the Hittite Empire. Before this list, my only knowledge of the Hittites came from Age of Empires. I swear man, every time I start up a random scenario and just looking for a little 1998 nostalgia, the Hittites come up and attack me before I can get my walls up. It's the worst. Well, this makes a lot of sense actually because the Hittite Empire was one of the first civilizations to reach the Iron Age in real life. Hattusa was the capital of said empire. Today, the very beautiful ancient ruins can be found near Turkey. So the question is, how did such a strong empire fall? The answer was the Assyrians. Over time, the Assyrians conquered more and more until Hattusa kind of just was depopulated. There's been some interesting finds at the sites as well, such as two sphinxes that the international community got into an argument over whose museum they should sit in. What's the lesson in this one? Well, nothing lasts forever, and maybe wait till they build my walls to attack me. Just wait, dude. Just wait. Number four, Volubilis. Whoa, what's this? Another World Heritage Site? During the first century of both BC and AD, the city of Volubilis in modern day Morocco was a cultural mixing pot. First settled by the Berbers and eventually became the chief inland city of the Roman Empire province that was located here, which I will totally mess up the pronunciation of, so I'm not gonna say it at all. People of both the Islamic and Christian religions would come here trading, living, and creating beautiful mosaics for over 10 centuries, and it became the capital of Idris I, founder of the Idris dynasty. The parts of the city that we have discovered so far include an aqueduct, thermal baths, and a triumphal arc. And they're all in pretty primo condition given all the crazy weather, earthquakes, and multiple different inhabitants over the year. It honestly seems like a place a lot of people should have heard of. Maybe I'm just the only one who hasn't, I don't know. Number three, Antioch. Boy, lots of learning today. And judging from the comments, you guys like learning from us, so thanks guys, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Besides a Monty Python skit about a hand grenade, I hadn't heard about Anatoc. I, who would have thought? I know. Sometimes referred to as the cradle of Christianity, it played a major role in Christianity and its longevity. Founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals, the city was in a prime location and benefited from all sorts of trade routes like the Silk Road, for example. Surprisingly, the city grew so much it even began to rival Alexandria, with an estimated population of 250,000 at its peak. Whew, that's a lot of people. It was a happening place. Sadly, it pulled to Detroit and went from a very profitable city to, uh, well, a not so popular one, as natural disasters like earthquakes and a declining trade made the city a not so happening place. All I know is that you pull the pin and count to three, not two. Three, and certainly not five. I do know that. Number two, Darren Kuyu Underground City. Hey, uh, honey, I, uh, found a hidden room behind the basement wall, and, uh, you're not gonna believe this, but it leads to an 18-story deep 7th or 8th century underground city used by around 20,000 people as a defense against invaders with ventilation shafts, waterways, stables, churches, and storage. So I, uh, I think the value of our house just went up. Yes, back in 1963, a local man in Cappadocia, Turkey, who was renovating his house stumbled upon an entrance to this massive underground labyrinth of chambers, shafts, and corridors that goes over 85 meters deep into the ground. It had huge stone doors and everything from schools to wine rooms for people to use as a defense against invasion and religious persecution. We don't actually know which civilization built this city, but it once connected to many other underground cities that have been discovered in the area with miles long tunnels. It's honestly the coolest thing I've ever heard of, and I may need to plan a trip. Speaking of, have any of these sites maybe made the travel list for any of you guys? Let me know down below. Mm. Number one, Leventa. 
Mesoamerica, cool place, lots of treasure and home of La Venta. These ruins are located in the spicy Mexican state of Tabasco. Constructed by the Olmecs, one of the oldest civilizations in the Americas, La Venta was a civic and ceremonial center. As a ceremonial center, there are tombs, mounds, and ceremonial offerings. Strangely enough, there's a pyramid as well, and some statues that have big head mode cheat enabled. They're big heads. It seems La Venta is a strange mishmash of little sites and artifacts, also including mosaics, altars, and some strange rock formations. All these lovely artifacts were not discovered fully until the 1950s, so Makes you wonder what else we've lost the time in that thick jungle. Number 10, the time warp. Okay, here's a very trippy fact for you. We all know ancient Rome, right? The lovable empire that took over a large portion of the world at its peak. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Caesar, Augustus, the Colosseum. Yeah, those guys, we all know how long ago that was, right? 2,000 years or more. They were pretty cool dudes. Today they are remembered for being a very successful empire and their triumphs. Well, what if I told you that the Romans are to us what the ancient Egyptians were to the Romans? Does that make sense? That makes sense. And they were still alive to tell the story. Well, at least some of them and some of it. Yes, that's right. When Rome was taking over, it was understood that Egypt was a land of great antiquity and there was much to learn. However, most of what we know of Egypt comes from Egyptian tombs, pyramids, and Egyptology from the early 20th century. Still pretty cool though. Number 9, board games. Call me crazy, but I love board games. My two favorite are arguably the most depressing. One being an actual fictionalized version of life and seeing who can rack up the biggest mortgages after having six kids as a police officer with a chef's salary. Ooh, fun. And the other is a recreation of the real estate moguls that charged exuberant amounts of rent during the Great Depression in the 30s. Wow, fun. Thanks, Parker Brothers. This may be because I have ancestors in ancient Egypt. I, I probably don't, but uh, we're just gonna roll with that joke anyway. I make bad jokes like that because ancient Egyptians loved board games. That, that was my connection. Yeah, I know, right? Games like 20 Squares, Hounds and Jackals, which is pretty much just snakes and ladders, and the most popular, Semet, which tasks players with moving their pieces on squares and eventually off the board. Kind of like Sorry, which is also one of my favorite games. I love Sorry. I think that we had a Canadian version called Getting Into Trouble. You know, the thing in the middle and you bop it. Remember that thing, the dice? Remember that? And you said, what are you guys doing? Getting into trouble, mom! So lame. So lame, dude. Number eight, labor strike. To say that it took a lot of manpower to build the pyramids, or really anything the ancient Egyptians ever built, is a little bit of an understatement. A lot of work went into it. Not only are the builds massive in scale, but also extremely complex and detailed, fooling some engineers today. They don't know how exactly they did it. Can you imagine building or moving all of those massive stones in the African heat and sun? I would need so much water. Just like today, it's really hot today. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't always the greatest job on planet Earth. Oh, surprise! And in one incident in the 12th century BC, the workers under Ramses III organized what may have been the very first labor strike. The workers had not received their grain rations and thus hid away in the monasteries until their woes were heard. It worked, and they were given their rations. Oh, so cool. The first labor strike, that's so weird. They have modern stuff too. Wow. Number seven, time warp again. Okay, here's one that's just kind of a head scratcher, but very true. And it has to do with the age of the Great Pyramids. The truth is, those bad boys are old, really old, older than your grandpa. And for a lot of ancient Egypt's history, they were there, regardless if the citizens actually knew anything about them. Constructed around 2560 BC, Ooh, a long time ago. Cleopatra, the most famous of all pharaohs, and the chicest of all celebrities in the 60s. I mean, come on, it's Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she's a good looking gal. Despite what modern depictions of ancient Egypt will have you believe, Cleopatra actually lived closer to the moon landing than she did the construction of the pyramids, which is really hard to think about. She was closer to JFK, the pyramids, Vietnam, and not the pyramids. That's, wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of hard for my brain to wrap my head around that. Number six, bowling. The next time you find yourself in a bowling alley and find yourself a little queasy, and you're not sure if it's the smell coming from your bowling shoes or the radioactive microwave nacho cheese you just ate at the snack counter, you can thank the Egyptians. No, not because they made sure to play weird animations on the outdated TVs hanging from the ceiling that were outdated the second you walked in there as a kid. 
they're old then. Or the carpet that screams 1980s and please wash me. But because they invented the game itself, usually done with stone pins and a stone ball, it was quite popular amongst the crowns back then. Very cool. Obviously, they didn't have the animations, but I think that makes it. You know, remember those, you know those weird like bowling animations? You know what I'm talking about? Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches. So much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. New Schwinstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome tall funny comedian with a neck thing, I don't know. Kings of Yieldy Times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. 
If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? Number 10, Desimviri, the law of 12 tables. Well, actually the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the Law of Twelve Tables. A commission of ten men, or also known as the Decemviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law-binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place, holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mehu, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kind of got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kind of sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them stone cold Steve Austining the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey. You got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Guess I could just like make a wall. And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. Number seven. Daily Acts. In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants' nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as Daily Acts at this point, or Acta Diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it. These were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? Ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. It took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the first triumvirate. Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival, Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter, Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis. Political differences, yeah. 
Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Eh, fare thee well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. In our number 5 spot today we have Toxic Waste. Despite what Smash Mouth preaches, all that glitters is not gold. Sometimes we find ancient swords and sometimes we find literal barrels of waste. This dump site here was first discovered off the coast of LA, 3,000 feet deep hiding in plain sight. These ROVs found roughly 27,000 barrels of toxic waste. This feels like a Simpsons episode, it's absolutely insane. What a horrible discovery. The 2021 find was deemed staggering. Yeah. That's a word you can say, for sure. In our number 4 spot today we have Mohenjo-Daro. This is a location whose name is said to roughly translate to quote, Mound of the Dead Men. This is one of the world's oldest urban settlements as it was found and built somewhere around 2600 to 2500 BC in what is now Pakistan, but it was abandoned in the 19th century BC as the civilization that called this place home declined. For almost 4000 years this site was seemingly forgotten about and the remains of it were undocumented documented until an officer of the Archaeological Survey of India, R.D. Banerjee, visited the site in 1920 and found a flint scraper which convinced him of the site's history. From here, excavations of the site began and as of the 1980s, it was named a World Heritage Site. In our number 3 spot today, we have Wolverine Fish. Hugh Jackman, if you're watching, this one's for you. This year alone, there have been over 212 discoveries of brand new freshwater fish. We love a new fish, that's super exciting. One of which is the X-Men inspired Hopalincistrus wolverine. These fish have strong lateral curved spikes called odontos tucked under their gills. They can extend and jab their prey with prongs, hence why the name wolverine is added to the fish's name. It's kind of cute, it has the claws, which is terrifying, sure, but he's okay. I do kind of love him. In our number 2 spot today we have the million year old plant. Back in 2019 in Greenland, a preserved fossil of a million year old plant was discovered. This was found under the ice near a secret cold war military camp. An ancient flower found at a cold war military camp. What a headline. In 1959, Project Iceworm was underway, I have mentioned this before, and that in itself is a pretty bizarre frozen feature in history. Eventually the project was scrapped and it was abandoned, but cut to 2019 it was rediscovered and scientists at the University of Vermont found parts of a million year old plant. Not what you'd expect to find under a secret cold war base. You know, the fragments were so well preserved that it looked like it had died recently. Not, you know, a million years ago. Studying these plants can provide clues on our future and where our current plants might just end up. In our number one spot today we have Ice Age art. Well to end off this list we have some ancient artwork. This Ice Age masterpiece was painted in the Colombian Amazon. The thing is, unlike other drawings found on the ceilings of tombs, this canvas stretches about 8 miles. It's incredibly long for an ancient painting. And for a modern painting, now that I think of it. These drawings date back to 12,000 years ago near the end of the last ice age. These were found in 2018, but it was only last year when they went public with the findings. The findings being paintings of elephants, giant sloths, horses, snakes, birds, and deer. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Number 10. Suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. 
I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locust were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locust keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I mess this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five, Feast of Fools. We have talked about this so many times, I have debated not including it on this list. But here we are. The Feast of Fools, where the lowest become the highest at least in terms of religious officials. Every January 1st, starting in France and expanding to most of Europe, expect to see parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing song, and lots and lots and lots and lots of drinking. There is a bit of debate on that point though. Apparently, at least in the church, it was a highly scripted and very formal event. But that's boring. We want to see Quasimodo hoisted up as the king of fools while people yell topsy-turvy. The more fun, non-religious application is as a relief from the depression-inducing rigors of daily life living in a society like that of medieval Europe. That sounds way better, right? Number four, Pleasures of the Enchanted Isle. Sounds like a Harry Potter sequel that didn't make it. it Harry Potter and the Pleasures of the Enchanted Isle. 
Don't bring your kids. What a name for a party. Okay, back in 1664, King Louis XIV decided to throw a big celebration for his mistress. Yeah, he told all invited that the party was for his mother, but really the spotlight was on his lady the entire time. What a dude. Already you're like, ugh, what a diva, classic. A week long party, I'd be out of there in three hours. I'd be yawning day one. Louis tried his best to keep the party going though, I'll give him that. He had outfits, a massive fake palace, he had a big float that looked like a whale, so those are fun. And he even had a ballet show. Yeah, nothing livens up a week long bender than a live ballet show in a room full of lanterns. Nice, now I'm definitely asleep. While setting off fireworks on day seven, the fake palace caught real fire. And at that point, everybody was like, yeah, we're gonna go home now, we must sleep. This is too much, I have a headache, I'm gonna throw up. Number three, banquet of chestnuts. Ah, the Borgia. We love an incredibly corrupt and hypocritical papal family. The innocently named banquet of chestnuts was a lovely way of showing us all just how hypocritical they were. On October 30th, 1501, an incredibly lavish party was thrown at the papal palace belonging to Cardinal Cesare Borgia, son of Pope Alexander IV, who both attended said party and had quite the time participating in it. Every member of the clergy was encouraged to take part and overindulge in all the finest foods, wines, and ladies of the evening that this uber wealthy family supplied. There was even rumored to be a massive, um, group activity that most, if not all, of the attendees took part in. What's with the chestnuts, though? The infamous party was named after the dancing ladies of the night picking up the chestnuts that were tossed at them by those sly and drooling clergymen. You dogs, you. It is debated whether or not this party was as lavish as we think. One, because the church tries its best to cover it up, and two, because the person who took record of it was Master of Ceremonies Liber Notarum Johann Burchard, who did not like the Borgia, but it was probably accurate. Number two, a lot of cheese. I love Super Bowl parties, but couldn't tell you one thing about football. I just go because my uncle makes this one dip, it's like a cheese dip, it's thick, it's liquidy. No idea how he makes it, no idea how he accomplishes such a task, but it's delicious. It's worth the commute every year. Sometimes cheese is just the life of the party and you have to accept that. Sometimes you're not a great host and cheese does all the heavy lifting. That's how life is. It's not about you, it's about your cheese. Cheese is better than all of us, okay? Hit that thumbs up for cheese today. Not us, not Big Ched, not me, just for cheese. Just cheddar cheese. 1837, President Andrew Jackson knew this. He was ahead of the game. He knew cheese was the main event. So during his last White House party, his big hurrah as president, he ordered a 1,500 pound brick of cheese to just be devoured. And then he invited 10,000 of his closest friends, hopefully who weren't you know, lactose intolerant, and went to town. If you're wondering how they got this cheese meteor to the White House from New York, well, they used 24 horses. And had to sit for two years before they opened the thing up. So you know for two years, guards were just standing there like, oh, I'm so hungry, I wanna bite so bad. Should I do it? I'm gonna do it. The ball of cheese only took two hours to finally disappear, and then it returned moments later just in the form of gas and farts and horrible, horrible air. Number one, Viking Christmas. Yule, or Yol. It's the precursor to some of our modern Christmas traditions, just with a lot more drinking and ritual life-ending endeavors. We have no specific date for this one. I mean, it occurred, well, we kind of do. It occurred every winter solstice and would last until the 12th day of January. Yes, that's 12 days of Viking partying, nonstop, too. They had Yule trees, just like our Christmas trees. There was a Yule wreath that was a giant wheel that they would set on fire and roll down a hill. Nice. They even had a Santa-like character, the Old Man Winter, who was invited to come drink with them, on foot or sometimes riding a horse. Very similar to Odin, actually. We know how the Vikings liked to party, too. In their giant mead halls, there would be massive feasts, dozens of roast poultry, horse, and beef, with enough beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines to sink a longboat. They had board games, dice games, and early forms of chess. They had ancient rap battles called flighting, which was basically who could insult the other one with the best rhyme. And obviously, they had drinking competitions. They sang, played instruments, had inebriated combat, recited poetry, and got very drunk for weeks on end. What more could you ask for? Yeah. 